All right, here's what I'm going to try to do this year, um, organize a little better. And so the first thing you see up there is basically sums up what we're going to learn before the first test. Okay, I'm obviously not going to cover all that information today, and I kind of abbreviated too. So um, chapter one, et cetera, which basically means we're going to cover all of chapter one and a little extra. Okay, chapter one. Uh, the first thing we're going to talk about are the characteristics of life. We started talking about that a little bit yesterday. You know, I figure since we're talking about a biology class, and biology is the study of living organisms, it's a really good idea that you understand, well, what is it that makes a living organism a living organism? we got to start with the basics. Basics, right, guys? Okay. And then I'm kind of going to take a detour. It's kind of weird. I, virus, viruses. I actually am going to skip a little bit over to chapter 20 in your book. It's kind of weird. Um, and we're going to talk about viruses. And the reason I talk about them now is because, well, we just got done talking about all those things that make living things living. I'm going to kind of talk to you about viruses, which are kind of this, uh, I don't want to say gray area, but they're not really, well, they're not living. It's pretty much been agreed upon that viruses are non-living things. They actually just call them non-living particles. But it's a good time to talk to them because they're kind of interesting little little particles. And uh, it, it, they do have some things in common with living organisms. So it's real weird. So we'll talk about that, but not today. <laughs> today we're also going to talk about the scientific method. Oh, don't roll your eyes. I know we talked about it last year and it's not the most exciting thing to talk about. However, it's so important. And um, hey, that test in March, you're going to take the OGT. They love to talk about the scientific method. So we'll review just today, and then we'll be done with it. We'll review basically those pieces, parts that go into the scientific method and designing experiments. And then finally, what we're going to do for this chapter, we're going to learn uh, the pieces, parts of a microscope. And then we're going to do some microscope work. Not this week, um, but next week. Anthony Baxter to the office, please. Anthony Baxter. <laughs> okay. <laughs> On we go. <laughs> On we go. <laughs> okay, yeah, not ideal. Well, yesterday we talked biology, study of living organisms. Hey, um, get used to using the word organism and not like, you know, it, 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 use that word. It's a very general word, which means any living thing. Any living, oops, I forgot the word thing. Any living thing, the word thing in there, that has or once had all of the characteristics of life. Any living thing that has or once had what I mean by that is we can't forget our friends that have become extinct over the years. So um, there's plenty of living organisms that were once around but are not anymore. Okay, so here's the point. In order for something to be called a living organism, it's going to have to have all of these characteristics of life. All of them. for something to be considered living. It's got to be made up of one or more cells. Okay, last year. Last year you guys took physical science and we learned about atoms and we learned about elements and we learned about compounds and we learned about molecules. Those are tiny compared to cells. What you got to understand is that a cell, uh, even though you don't really think of it as such, is pretty big. A cell is made up of tons of atoms, is made up of tons of molecules, tons of compounds. Okay, so in the grand scheme of things, the things we talked about last year are tiny compared to a cell. Cells are pretty big. Um, so if, so, if something were to be living, it's got to be made, cell is about as small as it gets, in other words. Okay, um, in order for something to be considered living, it's got to reproduce. It's got to reproduce either sexually or sex or asexually. In fact, there are actually some organisms like fungus 
that have this amazing ability to kind of go back and forth. They can reproduce sexually for a while, and they can reproduce asexually for a while. How cool would that be? I mean, that is, that's pretty neat. Um, but in order for something to be considered living, it's got to reproduce. Hey, oh, by the way, I want to clear up a little misconception that I know a lot of people have at, at this age. Um, plants. Let's talk about, let's say I just had like a simple flower plant sort of thing. Please understand that plants, for the most part, reproduce sexually. People don't think that. People think that, you know, if you've got a plant, it reproduces asexually. No, no, no. I think what people, you got to just kind of treat organisms are very diverse. So in a flower, for example, if I had a flower here, you got to understand that as long as there's male parts and as long as there's female parts, it's going to be sexual reproduction. Now, in the case of the flower, they're just on the same plant. So it's kind of odd. It's different from how we are. We don't have male and female parts on the same being here. But a lot of things out, a lot of plants um, actually do. And it's still, as long as there's male parts and as long as there are female parts, no matter where they're at, on the same plant, on different plants, whatever, um, it's considered sexual reproduction. Uh, can anybody name something that reproduces asexually? I can think of one type of organism. Think real simple. What is like the simplest kind of life form you think is out there? I'll give you a hint. Uh, usually they don't have a really good... Um, that's the word I'm looking for. They don't have a real uh, good reputation because of this. Bacteria, very good. Bacteria is about as, as simple as you can get as far as life forms. Um, and yeah, those little critters have the amazing ability to represent a sexually. All they need to do is just kind of sit there and say, okay, it's time. They pop into the Okay. Now, you have to think about it this way. This is why when you hear of infections in hospitals, like staph infections or things like that, those things spread like, like rapid fire because, <clears throat> because bacteria just bam, 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 bam. They don't need to find a mate. They don't need to waste all that energy trying to find a mate. They can just sit there and make, make two. So anyway, no matter how it does, it's got to reproduce... Um, in order to be considered living. All right, if you had Mrs. Fisher, <laughs> you should know what this means. Yep. <laughs> this is like her favorite word of all time, homeostasis. All living organisms have to maintain homeostasis, which means they have to maintain a constant internal environment. I don't care if you're a human. I don't care if you're a fungus. I don't care if you're one of those little tiny bacteria. I don't care if you're a plant. You've got to find a way to keep your insides different from the outside, and it's got to be very constant. you got to understand, on planet Earth, we live in a changing environment. <coughs> temperature, everything. Everything changes all the time. As an organism, you better make sure you have the mechanisms in place to keep your insides the same. One example would be temperature, body temperature. You guys know that if, you know, if we're humans, for example, if our temperature rises a little bit too high, it doesn't even really need to rise all that much, but if it rises a little too high, oh, problems. If it goes a little too low, hypothermia, oh, problems. We have a nice little cozy temperature that we need to be at. Now, every organism, that's temperature can be different. You know, what's good for humans is not good for something else, so keep that in mind. All right, number four, obtain and use energy. And here's a vocab word. Hey, remember yesterday? Remember yesterday? Um, I did this pretty cool demo where you mix two chemicals together and you make them glow. And I said, that's an example of a chemical reaction. It glowed. And I said, okay, what you're going to have to remember is all living organisms carry out chemical reactions inside of them. Well, 
the biological word for that is called metabolism. Metabolism refers to all those chemical reactions that are going on inside of, it, of, of any living organism. Yes, some people, metabolism works at different rates than others. Yes, yes, yes. But the same set of chemical reactions uh, generally occurs, you know, in every organism. Okay. Moving along. All organisms need to have DNA. I think we mentioned that yesterday. But not only do they need to have a genetic material such as DNA, but they need to be able to pass that to their offspring. So again, another characteristic of living things. Okay, the last ones are, just, are kind of generic, so I'm just going to let you copy them all now. They're generic, but they're still important. Number six is respond to the environment. It does no good for you as a little critter, whatever you are, if you're not able to find a way to respond to your environment, you're going to be in trouble because your environment is always changing around you. Grow and develop, kind of generic, yeah. Hey, even little one-celled organisms like bacteria actually do technically grow. Cells get bigger, not much, they go from here to there, but they grow and they develop, they change inside. And then finally, evolve. All living organisms will evolve. No living organism will stay the same. Now, granted, it takes a long time to sometimes be able to visually see those changes, but believe it or not, we have this piece of DNA, every organism does, piece of DNA inside that changes are happening all the time in that thing. But DNA is so big that the little changes that take place take a long time before they accumulate to the, where you can notice them. So that being said, all living organisms evolve or change over time. Okay. Oh, by the way, that's why bacteria, speaking of bacterial and staph infections and all that, that's why they're so hard to get rid of sometimes because... Since bacteria, as we said, reproduce so quickly, they're actually kind of evolving quickly too because their reproduction rate is like 20 seconds. So since they're uh, doing that, they're, they're changing, they change rapidly. Those little critters change all the time. They change so much that a lot of the antibiotics that are out there to try to treat them don't work anymore because when they change, they're changing in order to be resistant to those antibiotics. It's kind of a dangerous game. It's actually, that's kind of a part of medicine that's taken off lately is the fact that the medical field is kind of freaking out a bit because a lot of the uh, bacterial strains that are evolving out there um, are resistant to antibiotics. And antibiotics are useless on them. So, um, you know, most organisms like us, we don't, we don't evolve that fast. We don't change that fast. But we still do. Questions on any of that? Um, okay. Moving on. I'm going to... I, I, I'm curious. I know it's ninth, peri ninth period. I know it's eighth period. Remember how I told you... This is the same one you just copied. Remember how I just told you that viruses are kind of in their own little world because they have some things where they're kind of considered living and some things that are not? Can anybody, there's, there's two things on this list, two of these eight things that viruses can't do. Okay, and that's, and, and since there's two, well, even if there's only one thing they couldn't do, they'd be considered non-living, but there's two things on this list viruses can't do or viruses don't have. Any thoughts on what those might be? Let 
Now this isn't a hint. Let me just kind of stick the bug in here. This is good. Viruses. They cannot. They can't reproduce on their own. This is one. Number two. Viruses are funny. They need to actually hijack the cell in order to make more of themselves. So technically, they don't contain the machinery in order to make more of themselves. So they have to hijack a cell. So bam, one of them reproduction. They can't do it. They can't reproduce on their own. And their other one they can't do is number four. They can't make energy. They don't have the piece of part to do that either. We're going to talk a little more about viruses in another a day or so, and uh, you'll see what they're actually made up of, um, and you'll see that it's, it is kind of a weird area. All right, moving along. Questions, questions? Oh, this is just a, you can't read it. I don't even know why I'm showing it to you, but this is a, this is in your book. This kind of shows, excuse me, this kind of shows, um, all those characteristics of living things we just talked about, it makes it into a nice little pretty picture. But I won't go over that just because it's in the book. Here's what I do want to go over. Don't roll your eyes. The scientific method. Okay, it looks a little funny here. I tried to make the scientific method fit on one line, but that failed miserably. So. I do want you to understand just the basic parts of a scientific method. Again, I, I'm not trying to bore you, but when it comes down to the test in March, they will really want you to understand how the science process works. Starts with you observing something. Then you got to ask yourself some kind of question that you want to answer. Then you got to form a hypothesis, an educated guess about what you think is going to happen. Then you got to run, and I started, you see, I was, I, I, you have to run an experiment. Okay, and the reason I started is because that's really what makes science science. Science is science because you can conduct an experiment on it in some way, shape, or form. Okay. Uh, you form a conclusion from your experiment, and then communication. You tell the world how wonderful of a job you did or how it went horribly wrong. But either way, even if experiments fail, there's no such, there's no such thing as a failed experiment, is what they always say. Okay, so then down below here, this should look familiar. And again, we covered this last year, but it's so important for you guys to know the pieces, parts of an experiment, of a good experiment. In about a minute here, when I get done with this, you guys are actually going to get into groups and design your own experiment. Well, if you're going to do that, you absolutely need to know these parts of an experiment. Okay. Every experiment has a control group. Some group you don't treat. Every experiment has at least one, if not more, experimental groups. Those groups you do treat. Every experiment needs to have a bunch of constants, things that you keep the same in every group. And, in, and, and these two words that nobody seems to ever remember, your independent variable and your dependent variable. The reason you need to know what they mean is because when you design your own experiment, it is crucial, it is important for you to under, to know what those things are just to, so you can organize your thoughts. Okay, so your independent variable is what is being manipulated. Manipulated is a fancy word for changed. In other words, what is that variable that you're changing in each of the groups? Your dependent variable is what you're measuring. It does you no good to run an experiment if you don't know what you're looking for in the end. What are you measuring? How will you know if it's a success? Hey, remember last year? I'll get to those rules in a minute. Last year, this is the example I used. I used the farmer who got a bunch of different fertilizers to test to see which one of them would produce the tallest corn plants or something like that. Okay, so you had, you know, Farmer Joe set up his experiment. He got three bags of fertilizer to test. <coughs> they come in bags, I don't know, whatever. 
So three bags of fertilizer to test. So Farmer Joe, being the good you know scientist that he is, set aside four different plots. Wait a minute, there's only three different fertilizers. What was the other one for? Control group. Okay, so you got Farmer Joe has a control group, a, basically a group of corn plants that he just planted and let go. Let him Fertilizer A, fertilizer B, fertilizer C. Those are my experimental groups. Okay, so his the independent variable in that experiment would be what was changed in each of the groups, the fertilizer, the type of fertilizer. The dependent variable in that experiment is what's being measured. What would it be? Corn. The height of the corn. Very good. Again, you know, you look at these words and you're like, oh, I care. But really, when you design an experiment, you got to care. You got to know what you're doing. Speaking of which, oh, by the way, there are two golden rules at the bottom. Um, golden rule number one every experiment really does need to have a control group, or else you have nothing to compare your results. I mean, Farmer Joe, look at, I mean, he got all these different heights of corn. Maybe none of them are any different than what, and having no fertilizer. So you got to have a control group. Um, and you have to be careful to change only one variable at a time. Farmer Joe would have had a problem if he would have put different fertilizer in each group. But then if he would have also changed the amount of watering he did to those plants in each group, then he can't do that. That's what I mean by that. You can only make one thing different among the groups. Everything else has to be a constant. In Farmer Joe's case, you know, same plot, same soil, same species of corn being tested, same amount of light, same amount of pesticide application. I don't know. See, I'm talking like I know something about farming. Um, questions on that? All right, let me show you what I did up here. I actually have two different beakers up here. I set up well, last Wednesday when you guys were still home, basking in the sun, going to sports was, practice or whatever inside. you were doing. So you were inside. But it so wasn't too hot. <laughs> it wasn't even that hot out last week. Ugh. All right, here's what I did. I have two different beakers here. I filled them with soil, the same soil from the same bag. I think I bought it at Ace Hardware or something. I don't know. And I put the same amount of soil in each beaker. Um, inside the dirt, I placed the following items. I placed some banana peels, some apple slices, peels, things like skins, and some potato peels. Okay, so deep within the soil, not deep, but kind of just under the soil, I have basically compost stuff, okay? Um, being the good scientist that I am, I made sure that I even used the scale over there to make sure that I had the same mass of banana peels, the same mass of apples, and the same mass of potato skins. Okay, the only thing that I did different, and you could kind of see, one says dry, one says wet, I added 100 milliliters of water to this beaker. Um, the whole point of this experiment is to figure out in which beaker those scraps are going to decompose that or break down the fastest. That's the experiment. The, the decomposition rate, basically how fast will those items break down? Are they going to break down faster in the moist soil or in the dry soil kind of deal? All right, what's my independent variable? Was changed. The soil is the same. The water in the soil is different. So water, yeah, very good. The water is the same. Now, what is my uh, dependent variable? What am I measuring? The decomposition rate. Okay. Good. See, it's actually pretty easy. I mean, but when you said that, oh, by the way, constants. Oh my gosh, I had a bunch of them. Soil type. It, it would have been bad if I would have taken a bag of miracle Grow top soil and, and in one beaker and I would have put like dirt just from the courtyard in another beaker. That would have messed things up because that would have been changing two variables, not just the water but the soil. Oh yeah, I know this stuff is not the most exciting stuff in the world, guys, but you as budding young scientists, 
need to learn how to design an experiment. So here's what you guys are going to do next for me. You're going to design an experiment. Questions on any of that fun stuff? That should be more or less review. Oh, thank you. I was a different way. I've got to find a way to. Like, Mrs. Sims doing a good job. Huh? <laughs> Mrs. Sims doing a good job. I know, I'm not doing very well, am I? No. <laughs> I do. I just don't do well at passing out papers. Okay, so you're going to do it. This is strange. Believe it or not, guys, this act this lab here on this paper is divided into three parts. Part one and part two and part three. And if you look on the first page under part one, well, that's the one I already set up. So obviously you guys aren't going to do that one. The reason I already did part one for you is because I wanted you to understand the parts of the experiment. But what I want you guys to do is to turn the page and look at part two. So here's the deal. It says part two, guide and inquiry. Do all leaves decompose at the same rate? That's the question that you guys in your group have to figure out. Okay, so when I put you guys into groups here in a minute, um, you guys are going to get together and decide the following. Number one, discuss the decomposition of leaves, of leaves with your lab partner, partners. Recall times when you have seen decomposing leaves. What did the leaves look like? Did some leaves seem to decompose faster than others? Write your hypothesis. Work with your partner to design an experiment to test your hypothesis. Use a variety of leaves in your study, including deciduous leaves. What does that word mean? It is a type of tree. When it says deciduous, does anybody know what that means? Well, they kind of give you a hint. They say deciduous leaves and evergreen leaves, implying that evergreens are different. What's the difference between like evergreens and other types of leaves? Evergreens last longer. You're right. So deciduous actually means those are the leaves <laughs> that fall off in the winter. So good. Deciduous leaves is a general term for leaves that fall off in the fall, I should say. Um, evergreens obviously stay out all year, just like Jerry said. Good. Um, include leaves from the ground as well as leaves from the tree. Make a list of the different materials you will think. Blah, blah, blah. Here's what you're doing. Okay. You guys are going to get in groups. You're going to decide how you're going to design this experiment. You are going to have to come up with your own independent variable as a group. In other words, you guys are going to decide what you're going to change from beaker to beaker or from cup to cup. Okay. Um, what We'll stay the same. Everybody's going to have the same dependent variable because we're all going to measure how fast it takes for those leaves to decompose. Okay, with that being said, let's give me some ideas. What are some ideas that you guys can do? What are some examples of some independent variables you can do? You know what? I'm going to let you guys figure that out. I'm going to let you figure that out. I'm not going to give you your answers. Okay. All right. Uh, before I do that, let me... Oh, no. Um, let me hand out one more thing. I'm just going to have so many papers. I don't think I handed this out yesterday. I should have laminated this for everybody. In other words, do not throw this thing away. Do not lose it. You guys, this should look familiar. It's something very similar to what you saw last year. Remember last year you guys wrote up quite a few, you guys, a couple labs for me. Okay. Any more? Does everybody have? What's up? Oh, okay. All right. 